welcome everyone to Season 3, Episode 1 of Osiroshi Saturday. For those of you joining us for the very first time here on Osiroshi Saturday, this is a show that delves into the fears that go far beyond the mainstream. They look into those darkest places in the back of your mind and explore the world your parents always warned you about. This, my friends, is... Osiroshi Saturday! We start our show tonight with a tale of nightmares. Many times when I am writing this show, Ozuroshi Saturday, I have to research quite a few creepy things and look at multiple images and stories of some of the most horrifying things on the internet. That said, nightmares do occur. This is one of them. This is a log that I wrote down as soon as I woke up to record the dream that I had had. What follows is a verbatim writing of this log. My dream came to me last Wednesday night while researching this very episode. Like most dreams, it was only about 10 to 15 minutes long, but it felt like ages. It began with my wife and I moving our belongings into a giant rural house. It was an aesthetically beautiful house, and it commanded a very strong sense of Japanese-style architecture. Inside, the house had a few pieces of minimalist Japanese furniture, which had been left over by the past owners. Strangely, all the furniture appeared completely untouched and completely unused, even though the house itself seemed to be quite worn. The dream cut to a point in time where my family and I had lived in the house for a couple of weeks. An air of anxiety hung around my now silent family. My wife would not talk to me and stayed at work for long hours. My sons and even my pet cat had become super aggressive and were constantly acting out. They were wrecking the house and smashing my wife and I's belongings no matter how much we protested. I scolded, I punished them, but it did not stop. Soon, strange deformed shadows began moving at odd angles or in an unsettling manner, crawling around the house. The walls were jittering in a stop-motion animation of shadowy figures. Soon, after random objects started hovering upside down outside and inside the house, everything began floating in the air. All of my furniture began dancing around me. The dream room progressed at a wild pace. The shadows had become screaming ghosts running through my house every night at 2.50 a.m. Every time I woke with my wife from a sleep within sleep, looking around, checking on my children, I found them sleeping soundly, acutely unaware of the revenants. Finally, I decided we would be leaving this restless haunt despite my wife's protests. That night, two ghosts in the house were revealed to me. One was a sumo wrestler who had no corporal form or even an ethereal presence. Instead, he only appeared in the mirrors of my house. He is staring out at me with the look of near psychotic concentration. He is gorging himself on insane amount of food, piling large spoonfuls of mabudon, which is tofu with beef and rice, into his mouth over and over again, even as bits of his meal are brought back up by his overstuffed gut. The other ghost reveals herself as soon as the sumo's image gradually fades from the mirrors. The bone white woman is dressed in a dusty old red kimono. For some unknown reason, I understand her to be the wife of the sumo wrestler. She too stares endlessly into and from the mirrors. Obsessively and without pause, she continues to slather layers and layers on top of layers of makeup. Her process begins with her appearing flawless and beautiful, but gradually the layers of makeup distort and reach like mounds of clay, becoming preposterous and large. Clumps of geisha foundation distort and mar her beauty. An array of eyeshadow and lipstick turn the simple beauty of her symmetrical face into a disturbing, unbalanced visage which could best be described as a mix between a clown and a nightmare. The whole time, 
She stares unblinking into her vanity mirror, repeating the same process over and over, along with the same word, Atashi, 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 I, I, I. There is a monotone pattern in her voice, and never a change in volume or pitch. Finally, she suddenly stops speaking, and stops applying the gobs of makeup. She turns her head to the side, ever so slightly so that I couldn't view it from the back or the front. Everything goes dead silent for a bit before, finally, a shuddering light begins to focus on her face. Slowly, she begins to weep softly. Confused as to what was making her so upset, I approached the mirror tentatively, seeing if there was some sort of angle that I could reveal more of her or her story. She jerks with the sound of my movement, and her head shot back upright. Her makeup was dripping off of her face, and gobs falling to the floor, as though its consistency had suddenly become like a gooey liquid. Her beautiful face was replaced with a heavily burnt semblance of pain and overly tight skin. Her mouth appeared to be trying to form words, but all I could hear was raspy whispers and billowing smoke pouring from her mouth and overextended jaw. Sizzling strands of saliva hung like thick dripping gel sliding from her gullet. Pain rose from my stomach to a fever pitch and into my face. I was jolted awake by the horrifying image gradually tearing myself from the alternate reality of the dream world. I gathered my still very muddy thoughts and groggily wrote down this very dream. This is a creepypasta simply called Teenage Rebellion. I was a high school student going through a rebellious phase, writing off my parents. No, my entire family really as nothing but a source of pain, anger, and embarrassment. Mom was always interfering in whatever I did, and it was driving me crazy, absolutely crazy. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand her. And as for my younger brother, well, he was also really damn annoying, mocking me whenever I slipped or did badly on tests. Dad hardly ever spoke to me when we were alone in the house together, but as soon as Mom returned from shopping, the switch would be flicked in his brain, and he'd get so strict with me. He was obviously frightened of Mom and putting on some kind of show for her. Thanks a lot, Dad. It took a while, but I gradually came to hate the lot of them on a deep emotional level and wish them all dead. No joke, that's generally how I felt. One weekend, it was late at night, and, well, I was sneaking into the house after spending several hours out. I was hanging with all my friends in the game center with some of the savory characters as well when my mom collared me. Welcome home, stranger, she said in her usual sarcastic voice. I've saved you some dinner. Would you like me to put it out for you? Not a chance. You probably put poison in it, I answered before running upstairs to my bedroom. I didn't feel sorry for my mom in the slightest. She was always in the way. At her age, she should have known better and left me alone. Damn her babbling. It made me so irritable. Once in the sanctuary of my room, I slung my school bag on top of the desk, then dived under the duvet and descended into a maelstrom of doom and gloom. At some point, I got bored of my indulgence and decided to have a nap before going downstairs to grab dinner. I popped my head out for just a quick time under the duvet and rested it on a pillow. As I was maneuvering myself, I got into a nice comfortable position and then got the shock of my life. I couldn't remember clearly if I closed my bedroom door or not, but it was now open with mom and dad and my younger brother standing in the hallway, peering into my room with fake smiles on their faces. This latest example of their intrusive behavior disgusted me. Where was I going to get privacy in my own home? I'm just trying to take a nap, and there they were, observing me, mocking me, working out angles on me. I'd like to talk to you about tomorrow's plans, Mom said. It's a special day, remember? God, you're a pain in the neck, I cried. Every day the same old crap. Please close the door and go away. Can't you see? I'm just trying to take a nap. 
Their faces dropped and mom slowly closed the door. I then pulled the duvet over my head and fell asleep. My alarm woke me the next morning and I'd slept almost 10 hours straight. I felt awful for it. As much as I didn't want to go anywhere near breakfast, that's where my family members were and would now be congregated. I had no choice but to abide by an eternal truth. He who does not eat dies. So with rage and frustration in my heart, I made my way to the kitchen. When I got there, Mom was standing in front of the stove preparing breakfast. Dad was hiding behind his spreadsheet and holding a newspaper in the other arm, while my younger brother was turned away from the table, watching morning anime on the kitchen TV. I'm hungry, I said in an offhand manner as I walked up to my mom. What's for breakfast? She turned slowly. I was stunned. Her face was without any features. It had been reduced to a smooth sheet of skin, reminiscent of the legendary no perabo. Grilled fish and rice. It'll be ready in a minute, she answered. I screamed like a maniac. Dad put down his newspaper. My younger brother turned around in his chair. They both had blank faces. Calm yourself down. What's wrong, Dad said. Stop screaming. I can't hear the TV, my younger brother whined. It was more than my nerves could take. I ran straight for the door and fled the house into the street. I ran, I ran, and I ran. I was now seriously out of breath, and I had to slow my walking pace. I looked around at the passers-by. They all seemed normal. That is to say, they did not have blank faces. I began to fret about whether the Naparebo were simply having a bit of fun impersonating my family and would soon vanish and return my family to me, or if my family had permanently turned in to such monstrosities. If it was permanent, how could I possibly live with them? Impossible, of course, for them and for me if we were now different and not just person, but species. No doubt, they would be out to get me soon as I walked back into the house. Kill or be killed, I screamed, which scared the living daylights out of an approaching office lady and had her run across the street away from me. Kill or be killed, kill or be killed, I screamed. I spun 180 degrees and walked with purpose back to my house. There was now something heavy in my hand. I looked down. I was carrying a large carving knife. How I'd come by it, I had no idea, but it was the perfect weapon with which to defeat my family, and those who wanted me dead. I carefully and quietly pressed the door handle and crept into the house. Kill or be killed, I said in a low voice. Kill or be killed. With the knife behind my back, I walked through the living room door and entered the kitchen. It was as if my hysterics had never happened. My mom was cleaning the stove, humming a tune. Dad was flicking through the same boring newspaper. But my younger brother was nowhere to be seen. Hey, what have you got in your hands there? Came a calm voice from behind. I looked over my shoulder. It was my blank face, younger brother. I had to act fast before he alerted the others. I raced up to dad and slashed him mercilessly across the neck and the back. He began writhing and screaming, slapping the breakfast table as his white cotton shirt bled and turned a ghastly red. I wanted this horrible screaming to stop, I suppose. I wanted to put him out of his misery, so I slashed him again and again and again. It did the trick. All of a sudden, his body slumped forward, and his head slammed into the plate of half-eaten grilled fish on the table in front of him. The absence of a facial expression on my father weakened the horror and the anguish in my heart, but the inescapable fact... The inescapable fact was that I had just murdered my dad. Heinous, heinous and unforgivable. And yet, I was not ready to succumb to such guilt. I spun around to face my younger brother and without a moment's hesitation, I plunged the knife deep into his chest and quickly withdrew it. As the deep red streamed down his chest, he just stood there. 
I sensed a feeling like he was mocking me. I couldn't stand it. I summoned all the anger and strength I had and slashed him powerfully across the throat, almost taking his head off. He collapsed to the wooden floorboards with a dreaded thud. I then advanced into the cooking area of the kitchen to confront my biggest enemy, the detestable, nitpicking, interfering mother. Amazingly, she was still standing in front of the stove, giving it a good clean. No doubt her mind was shut down, refusing to accept the horrible reality. Well, that was her problem, not mine. I took a deep breath and slashed across her back in a perfectly horizontal fashion and was able to feel some pride in improving my technique. Mom didn't scream or groan as blood streamed out of the gapping laceration. I was amazed at her toughness. I raised my knife above her head, ready to finish her off, when all of a sudden, she turned her trembling body towards me. I staggered back, appalled at the sight that greeted me. She was no naparebo. Her face had returned. I'm so sorry, she gasped, before collapsing in a heap on the greasy kitchen floor. I had done what needed to be done and had no regrets. As I made my way out of the kitchen, I noticed a large cake decorated with strawberries and peaches sitting on the worktop table. In the center of the cake, written in icing, in mom's typical over-cursive hand style, was the message, happy birthday, dear son. May all your dreams come true. It threw my mind into disarray. I ran over to dad and pulled his head up off the breakfast table. I held him by his hair and his facial features had returned. His eyes were open, glassy, and vacant. They looked horrible. A moment later, blood began streaming out of his parted mouth and down his chin. I released his gory head and walked away. I next rolled over to my brother's body. He, too, had his face restored. He was clutching his treasured portable game console, which was still playing its merry little tune. I was now in hell. I screamed at the top of my lungs and buried my face in my hands, sobbing wildly. By my own hand, I had slaughtered my family. And that's when I woke up, tears in my eyes. It had been a life-changing dream. My rebellious phase had come to a sudden end. I no longer had any hatred for my family. A couple of years later, my mom suffered some kind of seizure. She was rushed to hospital but declared dead on arrival. Tragically, the day of her death was my birthday. When we got home from the hospital, Dad took me into the kitchen and showed me the cake Mom had baked for my birthday. The cake was covered in strawberries and peaches, just like the cake I had seen in my dream, and atop it, written in icing, in her typical, overly cursive style, was the message, Happy birthday, dear son. May all your dreams come true. Alright guys, here we are. We are into Ghosts on Film. We're going to start this out just by showing you a little bit of how this whole aspect of the episode goes. The first one you're seeing right here is just a family video, a home video of a grandmother and her granddaughter just sitting together and waiting to get a picture taken. And during that time, while they are waiting to get that picture taken, the granddaughter is actually pulled via her leg by some sort of unknown entity that we cannot see. If something does it off camera, that is pretty tricky as I do not know how that could have been done. As far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to have any sort of wire line, fish line or anything like that as you do not see her skin actually squeezed. You just see the legs start to jut off screen. As you saw right there, starting to get jutted off screen really quick, boom. I wonder what's going on there. I don't know quite what's happening, um, but apparently according to the person taking this video, this was some sort of ethereal entity attacking her. Very creepy indeed. Next up we have the same sort of thing happening. A young girl in her chair eating her dinner, when all of a sudden out of nowhere we see her suddenly get flung from the table. You'll watch here and have it happen without any expectation at all. She's suddenly just grasped from the table and pulled down to the floor, which is pretty intense. Not sure exactly how this could happen or how they made this happen. She's just innocently playing with her food, moving around her spoon, and then suddenly out of nowhere, she's just pulled to the floor. And uh, we never do quite figure out why or what did this. You can see the family very perturbed, very upset. 
and the audience member reaction, of course, very genuine because they too do not understand what is happening and nothing ever really was explained. So a very creepy situation. Next up, we've got a woman in the middle of mixing up her laundry, folding it up, uh, trying to choose the right thing in which to uh, possibly wear for the night. Just a good time with friends, going through clothes, looking for stuff. And we're actually going to find something captured here in the video that we did not expect. This is one of these type of videos where they're just randomly filming, uh, not really with the intentions of capturing any sort of ghosts or any sort of ethereal outside presence. When suddenly, when we do the replay, we find slowing down the film, there's something a little bit creepy in the background. Take a close look here as they slow it down for you. What is that? For me, it appears to be a pale-bodied woman figure curled up into the fetal position. Now, next up, we've got the same sort of thing again. This is an innocently random filmed aspect of the family life in the house. This tends to be a pretty common thing that we see where people are just randomly filming around the house. Here, it's just the little daughter, cute as always. Of course, something I do myself filming my own kids. When suddenly in the background, I can see it right now. You probably didn't just yet, but if you didn't, don't worry. They're going to do a quick replay and you're going to see it. And it's the mirror behind this girl. It's gone now, but right now in the replay, you're going to see they're about to show it to you. And you'll see exactly what horrified the video taker of this film. Take a look. There it is. Some sort of ethereal kind of translucent figure standing in the background. Now you can tell there's a panic right away as the camera jolts to the left and to the right, moving away from the scene because the person themselves, oh, whoa, you see that one right there? Yeah, that was creepy, man. You didn't expect that, huh? Me too. I didn't actually see that part before. <laughs> that really got me, man. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm thinking that one's pretty fake. Um, too realistic looking, honestly. If it was grainy or it was low quality film, I might believe it more just due to the fact that I wouldn't expect a ghost to show up so clearly. All right, let's move on. This is supposed to be the number one scary thing that this person found uh, while gathering a bunch of different ghost evidence on video. So these are some youngsters taking a camera along to explore an old abandoned apartment complex here in Japan. Um, its location is never given out because they do not want other people coming out to check this place. Uh, they tend to always blur out, block, or try to fade away any sort of address or location that would let people know. Now over here we've got some symbols on the walls. I do not have any familiarity with what any of those symbols are. Um, I'm pretty big into the occult and study it quite a bit, but I was unable to match those to anything when researching this video. Uh, moving on, we see a few religious items kind of stuffed around the light. The person there might not know that, but it seems as though as there's a palm from Palm Sunday uh, tucked into the light switch on the side there, which they pass very quickly. That will not really have any connected meaning into what you see here in the house later, but it does show that whoever lived in this place before had some sort of, I guess, spiritual or ethereal connection. Now, here's where we see our ghost show up. I want to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert to stop your blood from jumping out of your skin, and uh, it's going to be right when we back up here. That's when they see someone in the mirror, and at first you're just kind of like, well isn't that just the person filming? But then you realize they're not holding a camera. Going up closer we see these horribly ungodly eyes. Very creepy. Guys, that's Ghosts on Film. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure did trying to find it on the internet. Have a good one. I'm adding a new section onto the end of each and every Osoroshi Sare called Bukimi Bites. Bukimi literally means creepy or disturbing in Japanese, and bytes is literally like gigabytes or terabytes, whatever type you'd like. But it's concerning video games, survival horror, games from Japan, and strictly those that tend to creep you out and put you in a state of panic. Siren. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Siren, it is made by one of the team members of Silent Hill who left Silent Hill due to the fact that they found it to no longer conquer the type of fears and go after sort of the horrifying atmospheres 
that the older Silent Hill games, such as 1, 2, and 3, really, really portrayed so well. It gets more into the classic psychological scares and avoids the gore and the gun-toting, over-arm, strong-arm type characters that a lot of the more modern Silent Hills get into. No, Siren is a game in which you play the role of multiple protagonists. You are stuck in the middle of a small rural Japanese village that is in the midst of carrying some sort of sacrifice out, one in which we do not know what the purpose is, but we attempt to save the person being sacrificed. This brings together a camera crew, the young girl being sacrificed, and a young half-Japanese man wandering through the woods at the time of the filming. You play through as each and every one of these characters in a different spot in the game, and go through such horrifying aspects as being a little girl who's hiding in the middle of an old abandoned hospital as mutilated and deformed nurses roam the hallways looking for you. You also play as a young man attempting to make it through the rural village as zombie-like villagers roam around looking for your blood and flesh. You play as a young mother and a young man who are the father and mother of the daughter in the game. You attempt to go after a way in which to save or bring her back as she's been kidnapped by the monsters in the game, only to find that there's an absurd amount of body horror applied to her post-kidnap. She's now deformed into some sort of insect-slash-human hybrid that is absolutely one of the most horrifying aspects of the game. Within the game, there's many, many different types of monsters, starting out with just simple zombies, which give a new aspect to the survival horror series as you are given a power in which you can see through their eyes to attempt to figure out where they are in the game. This adds a lot of tension and a lot of strategy if you're looking to stay alive. Uh, you also encounter horribly deformed characters that are a mix between things like centipedes and caterpillars, hybrids between bugs, cockroaches, and humans, and even more horrifying things that defy description quite honestly. It's a game that I highly recommend to any and all of you who are into survival horror, Siren. Guys, I want to thank you again so much for joining me with this brand new season in the first episode of Osoroshi Saturday here in the year 2015. I hope we met all your fears, all the horror you wanted, and beyond. Until next time, come back if you want to enter the world your parents warned you about. Here on Osoroshi Saturday.